Coming up, the gender bias of alcohol. And that's where it gets really dangerous. And then, it actually took me out of reality. A meth head's final hit. I was thinking in my mind, I'm gonna be in prison for the rest of my life. Plus, 17 years after Columbine, one victim's story of faith lives on today on The 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of The 700 Club. I am here to pronounce the winner of the debate of last night, and it was the, the moderator, Chris Wallace. He did a superb job. He's good. And um, I'm, he's got a clinic to Lester Holt and those other people how to do it, and so we're very proud of him. But they talked about all kinds of things, abortion, jobs, voter fraud, immigration, et cetera. Um, and uh, I'm going to have some comments that I think shocked me. I had a hard time sleeping after watching that stuff. But um, that was the last of the three debates, and we've got a couple more weeks before the election. And uh, Terry? Yeah, well, it, it's always fascinating to mm. watch how these things come together. Trump and Clinton talked about their differences on the top subjects in the election. We have two reports from our CBN News from the debate in Las Vegas, and we're going to begin with Jennifer Wishon. No handshake set the tone as Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump met for their final debate, a reminder, if you needed one, of how personal this race has been. This exchange focused on a number of moral issues, the national debt, immigration, abortion, and the issue that's driving many Americans to the polls next month. The Supreme Court, it's what it's all about. Specifically, how the candidates would handle expected vacancies. It is important that we not reverse marriage equality, that we not reverse Roe v. Wade. That constitutional right to abortion is one issue that could be readdressed if the court's dynamic changes. I will defend Planned Parenthood. Trump says he'll appoint pro-life justices. It's some of the most direct language we've heard from him on abortion. If you go with what Hillary is saying in the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother. Well, that is not what happens in these cases, and using that kind of uh, scare rhetoric is just terribly unfortunate. The Republican doubled down on his tough immigration policy. We have some bad hombres here, and we're going to get them out. What Clinton said, says Trump's plan Department won't work. Law enforcement officers would be going school to school, home to home, business to business, rounding up people who are undocumented. October's WikiLeaks surprise has damaged Clinton, but she was prepared to take on the subject. The Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. Will Donald Trump admit and condemn that the Russians are doing this and make it clear that he will not have the help of Putin in this election? I don't know Putin. He said nice things about me. If we got along well, that would be good. Trump again denied claims of making unwanted sexual advances and defended his claims that the election is rigged. Moderator Chris Wallace asked whether he would accept the results of the election. I will look at it at the time. I'm not looking at anything now. I'll look at it at the time. What I've seen, what I've seen is so bad. First of all, the media is so dishonest and so corrupt and the pile on is so amazing. That's horrifying. You know, every time Donald thinks things are not going in his direction. He claims whatever it is is rigged against him. Here in Battleground, Nevada, Clinton has a razor thin lead over Trump. The stakes couldn't be higher for both candidates coming out of this last debate because starting Saturday, Nevadans can head to the polls early. Early voting has already begun in other battleground states, so the candidates will be working hard to spin their performances coming out of this showdown. CBN's Abigail Robertson has that part of the story. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, the two sides aren't agreeing on a lot, but one story everyone's spinning is the importance of voting in this election. An estimated 93 million eligible voters did not vote in 2012. I asked both sides why they think evangelical Christians should get out and vote for their candidate. The Bible says a servant is worthy of his or her high. She wants people who work to get paid. She wants women, infants, and children to be taken care of. She wants justice for all. That's why evangelicals should support her. Kellyanne Conway pointed to comments coming from Clinton's camp exposed in the WikiLeaks emails. For Christians to hear that a major party candidate who may be our president 
is calling us irredeemable, goes against the crux of our faith. And uh, that's the most appalling thing is how little she thinks of all of us uh, when we're not looking. Tony Perkins from the Family Research Council says he understands why evangelicals might be unhappy with either option. Character really does matter to, to conservative voters like myself. That's why I wasn't with Donald Trump in the beginning. He encourages evangelicals to get involved and make a difference. In many ways, this choice that we're faced with that is less than desirable is the result of our own apathy and indifference. It's time that we realize that we are responsible for this. We pray, we inform, we get educated, and we engage in the process. We are just over two weeks away from Election Day, and although the candidates won't face each other again, there could be many more surprises between now and then. Let's continue to pray for this election and our future leader. And remember, get out and vote on November 8th. Reporting from Las Vegas, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, it's very interesting. You know, the thing that, that really surprised me, and maybe it shouldn't have been surprised, but um, Hillary Clinton did not back down one iota on any of the left-wing radical feminist agenda. Not one iota. Now, the thing that they had a little hassle on, and I think you need to understand, they had a discussion of partial birth abortion, and Hillary Clinton said, well, you're just scaring people. That's the way you are. But the truth is, partial birth abortion is a nice name for the murder of a living child, because the child is already going through the birth canal, and its head has emerged uh, from the mother's body. And at that point, now listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, it may shock you, but this is what happens. The doctor takes forceps, jams it into a space in the little baby's uh, skull, and then from that can uh, put a, a suction on it and suck out its brains. Now that's what happens to partial birth abortion. There is absolutely no medical justification whatsoever because what that would do would put a woman much more in jeopardy when you've got a, a baby trying to be born and you're twisting it around in the birth canal in order to kill it. That's much more dangerous to a woman. And there's absolutely no medical justification for it. But Hillary Clinton d d uh, defended it all the way up and down the line. Then she came out 100% in favor of Planned Parenthood, which again was caught selling body parts of aborted babies. Now, and, and the founder of that was Margaret Sanger, who you know, wanted to pretty breed the thoroughbred, and she wanted to sterilize black people and so forth. Hillary's on board for all of that. And it, you just say, what is it? Uh, can we possibly have a chief executive in the United States of America who believes in the slaughter of unborn babies? This is murder. There's pure and simple, and that's what it is. And so don't say, well, that's scare tactics, Donald. No, it's not. That is what that procedure is involved in. And the left, the radical feminists, want to preserve that because they don't want anything to limit the uh, slaughter of unborn children. And we have killed 55 million, 60 million so far since Roe versus Wade. Maybe it's more than that. But uh, that's where we are. And uh, so what Donald said, I'm pro-life and I want to have pro-life judges, that was quite a thing. But I'm, I'm simply astounded. And David Brody is with us now. And David, I, I say it again, Hillary didn't back up on the feminist agenda one iota all, all the way up and down the line. She defended rather radical positions. She really did, Pat. Uh, there was no defense, or there was plenty of defense uh, for Planned Parenthood. And I thought it was really interesting. Donald Trump actually went ahead and defended the pro-life position pretty well, especially for Donald Trump, since this is in his uh, area, if you will. But he did a pretty, pretty good job. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting to see what's going to move forward from this, because I think that was a big moment for evangelicals. Uh, I think Donald Trump defending the pro-life position, calling Hillary Clinton out on partial birth abortion, I think will move the needle uh, to a degree with evangelicals. I don't think there's any question about it. And I have to say, Pat, uh, looking at some of the coverage of this this morning, by the mainstream media, relatively appalling. The New York Times, with their debate news article, uh, calling Donald Trump's position on abortion
abortion uh, hard line is what they called his position. They never mentioned Hillary Clinton's uh, view on par partial birth abortion as controversial or radical or anything like that. But Donald Trump has got the hard line position on abortion. It's fascinating. Well, David, the, the majority of the people now, they, 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 they may be supporting uh, Roe versus Wade or they may be called pro-choice. But when you get down to the nitty gritty and say, do you favor punching a hole in a baby's skull and sucking out its brains on the way to, uh, out of the birth canal, and people say, of course not, that's horrible, that's murder. And so the vast majority of the American people are against this kind of radical thing. And uh, I don't know, the, the New York Times has gone off the rail. I, I, don't, I think every semblance of objectivity has been given up by that paper. Well, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm up with an article this morning, narcissistically on the Brody file, Pat, uh, and it's titled All the uh, Bias That's Fit to Print, uh, the Shameful New York Times. Uh, uh, and you just can you can go to the website and, and read about it. But but you're right. And I think this is this is what we're talking about. And this is what Donald Trump and and many of the Republicans are going to have to deal with going forward. Um, what about this claim by Hillary that the Clinton Foundation is a great charity and that they're uh, spending 90% of their income on uh, their social projects. What I've heard is just the opposite. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Have you, do you have any update on that? Well, there's, there's no doubt some of that. Now, there's a lot of spin going on on both sides, but we do know there seems to be clearly a pay-for-play uh, portion of this as it relates to the Clinton Foundation and the State Department, and there are uh, ties between uh, both of them. But, you know, you mentioned at the top of the broadcast that you thought the, the winner uh, of this debate was Chris Wallace, the moderator, and look what he did on that Clinton Foundation question. Remember, when he brought it up, Hillary Clinton went into a soliloquy uh, about the virtues of the Clinton Foundation, and Chris Wallace put his hands up about 30 seconds in and said, uh, Mrs. Clinton, this isn't what we're talking about. I want to specifically talk about some of the concerns about the foundation. So we was able to stop, in essence, stop her filibuster on the issue. And I thought that was a, an important moment uh, for debate moderators to take note of. Well, she had it all figured. You know, you remember when Jennifer Flowers, that scandal came out and Jennifer Flowers was clearly Bill Clinton's mistress. What does Hillary say? Well, it's the, it's the news of the great right-wing conspiracy. And she said it with a straight face. So last night she said, well, these hacks are the result of the Russians. The Russians do it because they want to put Trump in office. I mean, that's so far-fetched, but she does it with a straight face. Well, you know, in basketball, they t tell you to use your feet and pivot. And uh, we saw a lot of basketball moves by Hillary Clinton last night. Plenty of pivoting going on. I mean, look, this is what John Podesta and uh, Jennifer Palmieri and the team Clinton have been trying to do for a long time, which is basically say, yeah, we heard about these WikiLeaks things, but, you know, let's talk about where they're coming from. And that's because of Russia. And that's all they want to talk about. And the media has been somewhat complicit in all of that. So, you know, we'll see. I, I, you know, I have to tell you, as it relates to the debate last night, Donald Trump, Look, he, he, here's some good news for Donald Trump. He, he really did win that debate on points. The problem is he stepped on his own uh, good fortune uh, with, the, with the headline that the media is talking about this morning, which is about the election results and whether or not uh, he'll actually support those going forward. So it was unfortunate for him that he made news in the wrong way for this 24 to 48 hour news cycle. Yeah. But I think overall, Pat, he actually uh, surgically kind of dismantled her on stage. And uh, it's just unfortunate for him that he won't get the news cycle spin coming out of this. Uh, okay, a couple of more weeks to go on the big day. Uh, how do you read it now? Do you, you know, I've, I've seen some polls, Rasmussen tied, others tied. He's down six in some other polls. What, what do you think? Well, let me give you some anecdotal information here. Uh, Jenna Browder, CBN News correspondent Jenna Browder, and I were just in Florida uh, this past week, and we'll be, be showing some of that to you on the 700 Club. And I can tell you anecdotally that there is a lot of enthusiasm for the Trump campaign in Florida. The polls show him down two to three points down there. But you look at the Clinton campaign, and we were there with them. You look at the Trump campaign, and boy, it is night and day difference. And I spoke to Adam Smith, a very well-respected political editor at the Tampa Bay Times down there, one of the top 10 political writers in all of America who told me on camera that he believes there are plenty of closet Trump supporters out there that will show up on Election Day. He says, so Florida should not be written off along with a lot of other states around the country. Uh, 
a stealth candidate. Is there any possibility? I mean, the, the people won't admit they're voting for Trump, and then, then at, the, oh, at the last day they'll pull the lever when, when they're behind the secret curtain? <laughs> well, I think there's some of that out there. The question is how much of it is out there. So, so we're going to have to wait and see on that, Pat. Well, David, thanks for the work you're doing. Just keep it up, brother. God bless you. You bet. Ladies and gentlemen, I may also add that uh, Donald Trump, the Trump people have uh, uh, requested uh, a rally at Regent University here in Virginia Beach on Saturday, the th uh, this coming in a couple of days from now, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so they're looking for a big crowd. It's a beautiful day. It'll be an outdoor event. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to that, too. I don't, mm -hmm. And then I will, I'll interview the, the Donald for this program, and it'll be shown next Monday. So I think um, uh, we'll, we'll get some important uh, news. I'm going to go into some important things that maybe you haven't heard yet, and I'll have that. But uh, the rally is, is open. I, I, I don't know. The, the Secret Service is doing everything they can to cut the crowd down, and I, I'm one of, I thought we'd have a big crowd, and so. Yeah. Well, I'm, it'll I'm, still, I think there will be a lot of people in these last days and last well, couple of weeks. Well, it'll be pretty. Well, I mean, here, I mean, here at Regent University on the campus, it's going to be gorgeous. Absolutely. All right, what you got? Here. <laughs> well, up next, the nasty hidden side effects of alcohol, and it's bad news for women. They actually have more heart problems than men. They have more immune system problems, more nerve problems. We'll show you exactly how alcohol affects the brain and the rest of the body when we return. Well, here's some interesting uh, medical data for you on this program. Both men and women can suffer from alcohol and substance abuse, but addiction doesn't discriminate between age, social status, or profession. But what few people know is that women, women are far more vulnerable to the effects of drugs and alcohol than men. And as Caitlin Burt reports, not recognizing that fact could prove to a woman, deadly. Alcoholism remains a leading cause of death in the United States. Given the statistic and the research poured into the problem, it's a condition that's often misunderstood. Many people think that alcoholism is a moral weakness or sometimes even a sin. That's kind of left over from decades worth of sort of uh, ignorance about what was going on in our brain. When someone consistently drinks large amounts of alcohol, it literally injures the brain. If you look at a normal brain, this part here is the limbic system or the control center. When you drink alcohol, it enters your bloodstream and goes to this control center where it releases dopamine. While that chemical can make you feel good, it also injures the brain as more and more dopamine is released over time. The alcohol essentially causes your brain's control center to short circuit, overwhelming how you think, feel, and manage your emotions. The problem is that when, if you don't have those types of functions in your brain, you're going to act very similar as if you had Alzheimer's where you're not going to make good decisions, you're not going to respond to, to appropriate rules in society. And whereas people really understand, if, you're, if, if they know you have Alzheimer's and you're running around outside without clothes on, they're not going to punish you, they're going to try and help you. Whereas if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict and you have the same type of brain injury, and you do something that's inappropriate, you're going to be punished. Another misunderstood fact is that females can become addicted much easier than males. When a female drinks, her body absorbs 50% more alcohol per drink than a male. Dr. Urschel helps treat alcoholics and other addicts at EnterHealth. He says the increased absorption causes greater <laughs> medical problems for female drinkers. They actually have uh, more heart problems than men. They have um, osteoporosis. Uh, they have more liver issues, they have more immune system problems, more nerve problems. This becomes even more of a concern as alcohol beverage companies spend millions appealing to women through television ads and social media. I mean, if you look at me, the social media and TV and all the messaging telling women, wine's fine, it's safe. In fact, if you're not drinking a glass of wine, you're kind of close to not being normal. And so when they drink a glass of wine, it, over time, they, they start getting used to it. Okay. They develop using the wine or the alcohol, the beer or the liquor to 
to cope with the stresses, the normal stresses of daily life, and that's where it gets really dangerous. 24-year-old Hannah Faubert believed all the hype and turned to drugs and alcohol when the pressure to perform in college athletics got to be too much. I was used to being the best. I was used to being the star. I went to Clemson and everyone was better than me. So um, after some time, I stopped playing soccer. It was kind of an impulsive uh, situation. And that's when it all started. That's where, when I lost all of my structure and my addiction began. As Hannah embraced her new lifestyle, the friends, parties, and boys, the addiction quickly took over. I was mostly lying to my parents. I was telling them I was going to classes. I wasn't attending classes. I was staying in my room. I was not eating. Um, I was suicidal, very self-destructive. That's when Hannah's parents stepped in and sent her to EnterHealth. There, she received a dual diagnosis, as is common with many alcoholics. Dual diagnosis is simply having two two disease states, two changes in your brain. One is psychiatric. So psychiatric can be anxiety, depression, manic depression, or other types of obsessive compulsive, other types. So all those mean is those are different types of neurochemical imbalances in your brain. And then you also have addiction. The alcohol or, or drugs have caused your brain to change, to be injured in a short circuiting. So you need to treat both at the same time. Hannah is now one year sober, but it hasn't been easy. Her first attempt led to a relapse, detox, and time in a state-funded rehab facility. Both she and Urschel stress the hardest thing for a recovering addict to understand is the need for constant maintenance. There's this false expectation in our country that once you're treated for addiction, you never need a treatment again. That couldn't be farther from the truth. At first, I thought once I was feeling better with my depression, um, I could stop my medicine and everything would be okay. It's just important to stick to um, the treatment plan your doctor has given you and um, keep going to meetings, focus on your triggers. But the key for me was just to be patient with my recovery, let my brain heal, let my body heal. While the alcohol damage never goes away, Urschel says the brain contains an amazing ability to reboot and heal. With the right treatment, there's an 85 to 90 percent chance it will go back to its normal state. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Dallas, Texas. Boy, ladies, just keep that in mind. And when your boyfriend decides, oh, come on, honey, have another drink, tell him to, you watch the 700 Club and you know better. Terry? Well, up next, a teenage runaway becomes a hardcore addict. When I met heroin, it was downhill from there. I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to face my problems, and I supported my heroin habit um, by prostituting. Watch how this woman goes from shooting heroin to cooking meth until a song sets her free. Looks like we've got a bunch of sad stories today about women that's got in trouble. Terry Walters was only 31 years old and she was already tired of living. Her childhood in Alaska had been a nightmare of abuse, followed by drug addiction in her teens, and then selling her body as a prostitute to get the next fix. Terry Walters was raised by an alcoholic father who was abusive in every way. I remember him pulling my hair, punching me, spanking me. I had no idea what being in a normal family was all about. By the time I was 11, I um, became a ward of the state. But for Teria, foster care proved to be just as chaotic. I uh, went from foster home to foster home to foster home. And that made me very rebellious. I was constantly running away. I was roaming the streets in the middle of the night, drinking alcohol. Teria's rebellion landed her in juvenile hall before she was 14 years old. But after violating her probation, she ran away for good. She left Alaska and started traveling down the West Coast. That began my time of um, using LSD. I loved it. I mean, just the things that I was seeing, how it made me feel, it actually took me out of reality. Teria's drug habit progressed into a full-blown heroin addiction before she was in her 20s. When I met heroin, <laughs> it was downhill from there. It took my feelings away. 
It made me not have to face reality. Um, I mean, I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to face my problems. And I supported my heroin habit uh, by prostituting. Terria did numerous stints in jail and even had a felony on her record. But nothing could deter her from her addictions. I would preferred to just go ahead and do my time, do jail time so that I can continue getting high rather than being on supervision, being supervised by a probation officer and not having a felony on my record. After years of running from the law and doing heroin, Terria wanted to stop. Her boyfriend suggested that she substitute heroin with meth. Being addicted to drugs and being high, there is no logic. I ended up getting evicted from my place um, because I didn't pay any rent and I had purchased a 64 foot old Greyhound bus, gutted it, and I put my furniture in it and I moved it out into uh, Big Lake onto a piece of property. And while the guy that I was dating was cooking meth, I was learning how to do it. Before long, her life revolved around the new drug. I hated being addicted, but I loved that it took away my feelings and I loved that it like made me feel good. After months of cooking meth, Teria was tired. She decided to try something she had never tried before. She prayed. I didn't like being the way that I was. And I specifically remember sitting in my bus, putting the pipe to my mouth. And I was putting the, when I was putting this pipe to my mouth, in my mind, I was saying, God, I, you know I don't want to be like this. You know, I, this is like, I'm tired of being like this. I'm tired of being addicted to drugs. Can you just take it away? So I don't want to be addicted anymore. I want to be able to stop. I just sat in it for a moment. I let it pass and I continued to get high that day. Just two days after her prayer, Teria's bus was surrounded by the Alaska DEA. They raided the meth lab and arrested her because of her extensive record. Eventually, Teria faced 11 felony charges. I was thinking in my mind, I'm gonna be in prison for the rest of my life, my life is crap. I just had no, I had no purpose and I, you know, I just felt worthless. I was just like, God, you know, you just gotta do something. I just can't do this anymore. On her first day in prison, Teria asked for a Bible. I could not put it down. I was constantly praying. And the first thing that I read was Psalm 40, that he lifts us out of the muck and rescues us. And I desperately wanted that. When I finally had like come to my, to a place of like realizing that how much I really needed God, I just, I mean, I completely just fully surrendered and said, you know what, God, I give my life completely to you. Do with it what you want. Do with me what you want. Change my life. Just make me the person that you intended me to be from the very beginning. Throughout her sentence, Teria continued to seek God and later became the chaplain's assistant. She graduated from a Christian recovery program and was released five years later on parole. Today, she is active in her church, has a great job, and talks about God wherever she goes. Being in his word and just having, getting to know who I am, who getting to know who he is, the, that I have a purpose, that he has a plan for my life, that I matter, that I'm worthy, and most of all, that he's my father. Jesus is the answer. And if he can change my life, he can change anybody's life. Surrender your life to him, get to know who he is, and watch what he does. He can make you a totally different person. Isn't that wonderful? He can make you a totally different person. The God we serve can make you a totally different person. You see, he doesn't need you to be perfect when you come to him. It's like a potter that takes a big lump of clay and he puts it on a wheel and then he shapes it and shapes it and shapes it and before long he bakes it and then he puts a glaze on it and suddenly there comes this beautiful piece of porcelain. But that's what God sees. He sees the beautiful finished product. 
He doesn't see all the mess. That's not the thing that's there. What's there for him is the finished product. And in Terry's life, he saw the finished product, something beautiful that he wanted to create. He wants to do the same thing for you. He wants to make you something beautiful. So you don't have to be afraid. Just come to him and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. I'm yours. And the thing about her that's so nice is she surrendered everything. She said, okay, God, I'm yours. I'm not holding anything back. I'm yours. If you just do that and say, Lord, I'm in your hand. Take me and make me what you want to be and watch what God will do. The miracle will soon be upon you. If you want that, just ask him. Right now as we're talking, just ask him. Say, Father, Father, you know what I've done. Father, you know I've sinned. Father, please take me now. I've made all kinds of bad decisions. Please forgive me. Take me and make me your own. And if you'll ask him, let me tell you, he'll move heaven and earth to keep you from being misled. He will move heaven and earth in your behalf. That's all you got to do. And if you want further information about what you do next, I've got a little packet called A New Day. It's excellent. A New Day. And uh, it'll tell you some wonderful things about what uh, happens next in your life, well, what it is to be, have the exchange life. If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. It's all in here. And uh, we'll give it to you free. But call and say, look, I just asked God to come into my life, and he's taken over, so give me some help. And somebody's here who loves you. Terry? Well, Stella had a teenage girl who was known for her faith and later killed for it. The mother of Columbine victim Rachel Scott remembers her daughter when we come back. Welcome back to the 700 Club. After years of court battles, the Christian-owned bakery Sweet Cakes by Melissa is closing its doors. The Oregon-based company was targeted by LGBT activists when owners Aaron and Melissa Klein said they would not bake a cake for a gay wedding because of their Christian beliefs. The subsequent legal battles crippled the bakery. The Kleins had been operating out of their home for the last few years. Although they've decided to close shop, they will still stand up for religious freedom. They face a $135,000 fine and will continue to appeal it. The president of Nigeria is promising to redouble efforts to secure the release of the nearly 200 schoolgirls who are still missing, more than two years after being kidnapped by radical Muslims. The Nigerian president met Wednesday with the 21 Chibuk girls, schoolgirls, who were released last week after negotiations with the radical Islamic group Boko Haram. Chibuk is a conservative Christian enclave in primarily Muslim northern Nigeria. Many parents there are involved in translating the Bible into local languages. The liberated girls told their parents they were given the choice of joining Boko Haram and embracing Islam or becoming their slaves. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. After Rachel Scott died, her funeral was broadcast worldwide on CNN, and more viewers watched that than the funeral for Princess Diana. Rachel Scott was just 17 when she died. Her courageous stance at the end of her life has inspired millions in the years since. On April 20th, 1999, two gunmen murdered 13 people at Columbine High School. 17-year-old Rachel Scott was one of the victims. Her strong faith permeated her life, her journals, and even the books written about her after her death. Now her story comes to the big screen. I'm Not Ashamed opens in theaters October 21st. Rachel's mother, Beth Nimmo, joins us now. Beth, it's nice to have you on the 700 Thank you. Club. I'm happy to be here. 17 years have passed. Goodness, it doesn't even seem possible to me when I know that in my <laughs> head. But d does it ever, does the pain ever go away? I mean, the loss of a child is such a deep-seated thing. 
Well, the loss is always there, but the Lord is faithful to heal your heart. Mm -hmm. You come to a point where you don't cry all day long. You can sleep at night again. Yeah. You can remember her without tears and there's laughter. Um, but that's a process and it's, it doesn't come easily. And you, you have to want that. You have to, you have to want to be healed, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so we've had to work at that because it left such a hole in our lives. Oh, I can't imagine. After her death, you discovered six diaries. I mean, she was quite the writer <laughs> and the artist as well. But what did she write about in her diaries? Well, there were actually more than six. They were everywhere. We found them. Wow. Uh, but um, she, she, was, she was having a conversation with the Lord in a lot of these writings. Mm -hmm. She was leaving us her story. She was telling us what was happening at her school with her friends. And then she was writing about uh, her relationship with the Lord. And the Lord, in turn, would inspire her, I believe, to leave very prophetic writings. And those were what we took away as far as this is the real mm -hmm. story, the, the back story of Columbine that we need to share. Speaking of prophetic, there was a sketch, a picture that she drew in one of her journals. Was it the morning of? It was. The day that she it died? It was. Um, that morning of April the 20th, 1999, she sat in class, going from class to class, drawing. And the Lord just was inspiring her to draw. And what she didn't know was wow. she was drawing what was going to be happening within the hour. And um, it shows a, pi a picture of weeping eyes with a stream of blood coming from her temple, which was the fatal shot for her. Mm -hmm. uh, and it f goes down in their eyes. There are 13 teardrops in that picture. And there will be 13 murdered that day. And she's a teardrop in her own picture. Wow. There are so many people at the time and since then inspired by Rachel's courage, for one thing, by the depth of her faith, by her strength in the midst of such adverse, terrifying circumstances. Did her inspiration in the lives of other people help you as you dealt with your own pain and loss? Well, we saw purpose in, yeah. in, in what God was doing. And because he prepared her for that, she had many writings about a, a premature death. On April the 20th of 1998, she wrote, it's like I have a heavy, heavy heart, this burden on my back. And then she goes on to talk about, I'm not going to apologize for speaking the name of Jesus. I'm not going to hide the light they put in me. And if I have to sacrifice everything, I will. I will take it. Well, one year to that day, she keeps that vow. Mm -hmm. And two weeks after that writing, she writes, this will be my last year, Lord. I've gotten what I can. Thank you. And then two weeks prior to her death, she writes a drowning poem. And the last stanza of that is, it isn't suicide. I consider it homicide. The world you have created has led to my death. Wow. And we've created a world where our children are dying for very sad, sad reasons. And I believe God was just preparing her as a voice mm -hmm. and as a witness of light to come out of a very dark day. And maybe preparing you too, Beth, because now these many years later, when what she spoke was prophetic, and we, we have seen a generation of children lost without understanding their rich spiritual heritage, without feeling a sense of purpose in their lives. Now the film, I'm Not Ashamed. Why now? Well, the timing is right. Uh, we tried to do this a few years before I had partnered with a man, been a prophet. And uh, we tried to do this back in 2008, and it just wasn't allowed to happen and come together. I believe the time is ripe now. Social media has Making, is making every effort to redefine who our children are, mm -hmm. you know, and they're caught up in this uh, fast current that, that they don't know how to get out of. And um, we, we're trying to bring things back full circle, back into the family, bring the authority back into the family, bring the foundations back into the family. And one of the things Rachel left uh, on the back of a dresser that we found a year after her death was her hands that she had sketched and in the middle of those, it said, these hands belong to Rachel Joy Scott and will someday touch millions of people's hearts. So it's the heart that we're after. Mm -hmm. What's it been like for you to do a film about such a um, violent and devastating scenario must take you back to relive this whole thing again. How have you handled that? Well, it, it's been an emotional uh, project. And it's not so much the events of that day, as all the family memories. Mm -hmm. Those bring 
yeah. <laughs> emotion. But um, it, it was a story that needed to be told. And because Rachel was the first one to die that day, I'm blessed not to have to go into the whole event the whole, mm -hmm. and the, the terror and uh, violence of that day. You mentioned the impact of social media on the lives of our young people today. And I know that just the trailer for the film, which we just saw a little bit of, um, has had an interesting impact. I mean, YouTube blocked it they for did. a while and you've had some negative commentary. What's happening with that and why? Well, I, I think it's the enemy at work. He has fought hard and long to keep this story from being told. Uh, we have faced spiritual warfare from the very beginning. So on set every day since we started this project, we've had intercessors. Mm -hmm. We have you know, fasted and prayed that the Lord protect the story and allow us to tell it the, the closest to God's heart as possible. And um, there was a lot of effort made, even when Columbine happened to take God out of the equation, yeah. you know, of course. Th none of this happened. Of course. These kids weren't challenged for their faith. But the truth is they were. And so it's just another ploy the enemy throws in your path to uh, disrupt what God wants to do. What do you want the takeaway to be for people who see I'm not ashamed? Well, it's kind of twofold. I want kids to um, really be motivated and inspired that they can live their life and live it well. And God will bless them and that they don't have to be perfect to be used by God because God doesn't have any perfect people. So you qualify if you just want to be used, you know, if you're willing and obedient. And the second takeaway I want is for parents and grandparents. I want them to engage with their children, find out what's going on and build some uh, strongholds around their children, spiritual strongholds that the enemy can't tear down yeah. and, and get to them because he works 24-7, 365, and they are so vulnerable in this uh, culture that we live in. Absolutely. Well, Beth, thank you for sharing your story. We look forward to seeing the story and the message of I'm Not Ashamed. That's the name of the film. It's rated PG-13. I want you to know it opens nationwide tomorrow, so be sure to see it. In fact, use it as an opportunity to talk to your children about the things that really matter. We'll be back right after this. Thank you. Coming up, time to bring it on. Your email questions are next, so don't go away. In the blink of an eye, Rene lost it all. His home and everything he owned was washed away in a storm. Rene couldn't rebuild, but thanks to viewers like you, he didn't need to. Rene is a single dad. He does his best to protect and watch over his two small children. But he says the weather and the fact that their house sits on stilts over a river really makes him nervous. Renee's 11-year-old son, Ray, has picked up on his dad's fear. We are scared we might drown and die. Then, a typhoon hit their community in the Philippines. Many people drowned. The river rose and everything we had washed away. After the storm, Rene sifted through the rubble with other survivors for their belongings. He didn't make enough as a bicycle taxi driver to rebuild, so he and the children ended up in a shelter. I'm growing old. I just want my children to have a safe home. When CBN learned about their situation, we built them this new house far from the river. Its reinforced cement walls can withstand earthquakes and winds up to 150 miles per hour. I was so excited to choose my bedroom. It's a big relief to know we will be safe in our new house. Rene was so grateful for the house we gave him that he helped us build more houses for other typhoon victims in this CBN community of hope. Thank you, CBN, for our new house. Well, that's in his part of the world, but you've seen it right here at home recently. The damage of big storms, of lots of rain, too much rain, high winds, it can leave you with nothing left. Here in the United States, we have 
programs, we have churches, we have people who come alongside of us to help, but in other parts of the world, people simply don't know how to even begin to start their lives again. This single dad raising his kids is now doing well because of your generosity and kindness. We want to say thank you, 700 Club members. You are impacting lives around the world every single day like that. Listen, some of you aren't 700 Club members yet, and we want to encourage you to do just that. In fact, I want to say even to those of you who are general 700 Club members, would you go up to the next club level? What a difference it makes when that happens. All you have to do is call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000, and just say you want to join the 700 Club. Tell them what level, and they'll gladly receive your gift today. Our way of saying thank you to for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest gift. It's called the Gospel of John. He's read it on two CDs for you. We'd love for you to have this. In fact, I have a comment from Sandra who lives in Youngstown, Ohio, who says, I was having a health issue where my eyesight was a bit blurry and I was unable to read with these. I found the Gospel of John CD so rewarding to listen to. Thank you and God bless you. You know, the Gospel of John is called God's love letter to us. We want you to have this. So call today. Make a difference in someone else's life, and we'll send this out to you immediately. Amen. Okay, let's Time take, for some email. Let's, Are you ready? Let's, let's bring in the horse This again. is a viewer who <laughs> says, if your spouse has committed adultery but has repented and asked for forgiveness, is it still okay to divorce them? I don't know that I want to forgive. Look, uh, I'm telling you, you're missing what God says. Jesus said, when you stand praying, if you have ought against any, forgive. And <clears throat> when you say your spouse was committed adultery, I mean, hey, People do that all the time. I don't excuse it, but it happens. And so the Bible says forgive. No, you, you do not have any ground to, to hold a grudge. If you do, it will corrode you. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Sarah who says, help, Pat. I've heard so many scholars, preachers, teachers say the rapture of the church comes before the Antichrist. But studying the word in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3b, 2, 3b, it reads, that day will not come and the man of sin is revealed. Please help me understand. I've prayed for an answer so I will understand, but so far no answer. I trust your knowledge of the Bible. All right, look. First of all, focus on what's going on now. Don't be spending all your time worrying about a man of sin coming and so forth. I mean, it'll happen, it'll happen, and until it does, don't worry about it. But yeah, there is so much this false teaching that was introduced at the Irving Wright meetings about 1830. A little girl was giving, uh, a 17-year-old girl, was giving a uh, message in tongues and an interpretation, and she started talking about all these things. A man named John Nelson Darby was there. He was thought it was great. He was Plymouth Brethren. So he started this this whole uh, stuff about, you know, pre-tribulation and rapture and all these things. None of it's in the Bible. It, it's not biblical. But you're right. The Bible says, this day will not come until the man of sin is revealed. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. But it also says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shadow of command and the trumpet of God and the dead of Christ will raise and then we who remain will be caught up to be with him in the Lord. We believe in the rapture, but the rapture comes at the end of the age. Jesus is going to come back and he will take his church to himself. End of story, end of the age. Until that happens, it's not going to be a secret catching away then seven years later and all that stuff. That just isn't in the Bible. All right. This is David who says, why is it okay for Christians to practice made up things like Christmas and Easter? <laughs> well, you say it's made up. I mean, you know, you got to have some celebration. I mean, Christmas, you, you want to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So, okay. The Catholic Church picked up the winter solstice and it was a nice holiday. And so they Christianized it. Easter was made up for the goddess Astarte. That's what Westra, Astarte, that's where it came from. Okay. But you've got to have something for the resurrection. It, 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 it followed the Passover. So what's with your problem about made up holidays? You've got, you got to celebrate it sometime. So someday he was born and you celebrate that. So it could just as easily have been uh, December the 25th or some other time. So. Why get all hung up on specific dates? We honor the Lord as his resurrection. That's what Easter's about. He is risen. The fact is, he rose from the dead with a shout of triumph. That's what we celebrate. The fact that it 
comes when it comes, and we seem, quote, made up. Don't worry about things like that. <laughs> worry about what's important, and that is serving Jesus. We leave you with today's Power Minute from Lamentations. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. Thanks so much for being with us today. And uh, for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and Lord willing, the 700 Club will be with you tomorrow. Don't miss exciting things.